A fundamental worldview question with which we all struggle is the question, where did we come from? We can broaden that question to include all of the universe. Where did the universe come from? How did it come into existence? When did it come into existence? We can even broaden that set of questions. Is the world that I can observe all that really exists? Is there a God? Do other spiritual forces exist? What role might these other forces have had in the beginning of the universe? In our own society, these questions have been debated significantly by scientific and Christian communities. This debate has often led to what has been called the creation-evolution debate. The problem with this debate is that both sides have too often lost objectivity in their discussions, and so they have become overly focused on the issues about which they disagree. In the process, they miss out on some of the important questions that people are asking. They also fail to grapple with some of the key findings and teachings with which their own communities must discuss. For this reason, I have chosen to move into our discussion of creation by first grappling with some of the key teachings found in Genesis 1. We will then spend some time discussing the biblical teachings about the nature of God and the nature of man. After laying that foundation, you'll engage in a process in which you reflect on the creation-evolution debate. Genesis 1, 1 through chapter 2, 3 is important because it provides an introduction to the book of Genesis. It introduces the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, also known as the Law or the Torah, and it also introduces us to the beginning of the entire Bible. These verses are firmly rooted in the history of Israel. In fact, many scholars believe that Genesis 1 through chapter 2 existed in story form for many years uh, before it was actually written down. For generation after generation, the story of the beginning of the universe was told and retold so that every, every Israelite knew the story. When it was time for Moses to write the book of Genesis, it was completely natural for him to include this widely embraced truth as the beginning of his work. Genesis comes from a Latin word meaning to be born. The title of this first book of the Bible is taken from the first Hebrew word uh, in the Bible, Bereshit, and it literally means in the beginning. This word is not only the title of the book, but it's also one of its themes. Genesis is a book about beginnings, the beginning of the universe, the beginning of sin, the beginning of God's covenant relationship with humankind, etc. In recent decades, there's been a significant tendency to read much of the creation evolution debate into our study of Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3. So we've not often focused adequate attention on the key teachings that God has for us in this passage. So in this brief presentation, I want to uh, address these four key teachings that are found in Genesis 1. The first is the idea that the beginning of the universe was intentional. Genesis 1.1 is a statement of introduction and intentionality. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning is intended to mark a point in time when God began to act in a certain way. The phrase is not intended to point us to a certain date, such as when Usher, in his famous decree, uh, went through all the chronologies and decided that the beginning must have been at 4004 BC. That date is doubtful and, and it's definitely not the intention of the biblical record to, to point us to a specific date like that. When it says that God created, this points to the intentional and singular action of God. The word used in Genesis, bara, is only used of God in the Bible. The intentional work of God can be seen by his activity. God speaks creation into existence, but he's also said to, to see, to separate, to name things, to form, to gather, to charge creation to reproduce things. He gives them purpose. He places them in their position. He blesses them. He gives them directions. God gives. Do you get that picture? Creation was the personal work 
of a God who delighted in working with heaven and earth and forming it into meaningful existence. We do well to listen to Platinga's warning. Creation is neither a necessity nor an accident. Creation is an act that was fitting for God. You see, sometimes we ask a completely legitimate question. Why did God create us? And then we want to say that God needed our worship or needed our relationship. But really, that's baloney. Platinga corrects. Creation was a way for God to spend himself. I think we're safe in assuming that God wasn't bored. God wasn't necessarily a venture capitalist looking for a risky investment such as the human race. We may assume as well that God wasn't lonely. Nobody said it's not good for God to be alone, so let there be birch trees and bullfrogs and advertising executives. But if creation is not necessary for God, neither is it an accident or a whim, as if God were doodling one day with a cosmic magic marker, drawing stick men and stick women to idle away a few thousand years of eternity, and then sighed enormously and discovered to his amazement that the figures were starting to swell and stir with the breath of life. We also see in Genesis 1 that the beginning of the universe was orderly. In Thomas Mann's book, The Book of the Torah, he suggests that order is the primary theme of this passage, and he writes, Readers who search for a connection between the sequence of creative acts reported here and a scientific description of the origin of the universe will search in vain. The author is interested in the artistry of the created order, not paleontology. The orderly structure of his work reflects the orderly design of the cosmos. Every part of the world appears uh, before us in a perfect balance and symmetry, majestic and wondrous. So the story itself is told in an orderly manner. Every section of the story opens with, God said. And then, God either calls, or places, or blesses, or creates. And then each section closes with the phrase, There was evening, and there was morning, the first day, or the second day. Notice, too, that the order of creation extends to the creation itself. God declares that each species that he has created is to multiply after its own kind. The order in which things were created uh, also shows us the orderliness of God's activity. Notice the parallelism here uh, in the days of creation. On the first three days, God places the light in the sky and the seas in the land. And then in days four through six, in parallel fashion, he fills those areas with luminaries and birds, animals, and man. Notice that the one break in order in this passage seems to be uh, all this information about the seventh day. It follows some of the patterns mentioned, but not as rigidly as, as the others. Perhaps this is fitting since it is the day that is set apart or it's different. It should not look like the others. The other days are a time for activity and movement. Day seven is for rest and reflection. Thirdly, we see that the beginning of humankind was the climax. God's activity and interaction with creation seems uh, to build until we finally reach day six. After creating the universe and a variety of, uh, uh, of creation, other creative uh, things that he's done, there's divine consultation. It's almost as if, if God is talking to himself and then the Godhead declares, let us Make man in our image, according to our likeness. This is what sets humankind apart. We are made to reflect the personality of God. We're made to relate to God in a unique way. We'll discuss more about what this means uh, a little while later, but this is definitely the climax of the Genesis 1 record. After creating humans, God gives them the contents of creation and charges them with the responsibility to rule over it. This is what Platinga has called the idea of dominion, or it's our cultural mandate. 
Notice that it's not a license to conquest creation, but it's our responsibility to stewardship it. And so Latinga writes, let them take responsibility for keeping the earth, for respecting the integrity of the kinds, the times and the seasons. Let human beings discover the character of other creatures and do what they can to assist those creatures to act in their own character. So we see that humans are the climax of creation and we're distinct from the rest of creation. Fourthly, we see that the beginning of the universe was good. Throughout Genesis 1, God looks at creation and declares that it is good. Good is from the Hebrew word tov, which has the following meanings. The root refers to actually good or goodness in its broadest sense. And we can look at five different general areas of meaning. It can be good in, in the practical, economical, or material sense, in the, in the sense of it being abstractly good or desirable, pleasant, or beautiful. Uh, we can speak of its goodness in terms of its quality or its expense. It can refer to moral goodness, and it can refer to something that's philosophically good. A combination of these meanings would, um, uh, would apply to God's declaration at this point, I believe. He's looking at the whole thing, and he says... It is good in every sense of the idea of goodness. In concluding, I want to point out a few additional teachings uh, that emerge uh, regarding creation that emerge from the Genesis 1 text. First of all, God created a realm, uh, rather this is uh, beyond the Genesis 1 text. We see these emerging in other texts in the scripture, but they add to our knowledge uh, about creation. First of all, God created a realm of spiritual beings in addition to the observable universe. So while Genesis 1 deals exclusively with the creation of the universe as ordered by man and uh, humankind and, and makes no reference really to the creation of spiritual beings, we do know that God did indeed create a spiritual realm which was also orderly and good. By the time we arrive at Genesis 3, we discover that Satan has fallen from that state of goodness or rightness before God and has proceeded to tempt Adam and Eve. We can read of Satan's fall in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. We also know that spiritual beings were created prior to Genesis 1 because God says to Job in Job 38, 1-7, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you when the spirit beings were with me in heaven? Secondly, we see in scripture that God created the universe ex nihilo, which in Latin literally means out of nothing. So in Hebrews 1.3 we read, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out, out of things which are visible. And we read in Romans 4, 17, that God calls into being that which does not exist. A third teaching we see uh, in Scripture is that Jesus Christ sustains, or, or he holds together creation, and he gives it purpose. So in Colossians 1, 16 and 17, we read, For by him... In meaning Christ, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And fourthly, we see in scripture that creation reveals the glory of God. So in Romans 1, 18 through 25, we read, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and, un and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident uh, within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, 
being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor God as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their own speculations and in their foolish heart and dark and darkened heart. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and of four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. They worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We also read in Psalm 19.1, The heavens themselves are declare, declaring the glory of God. When we speak of revelation, we're speaking of the, uh, this process uh, in which God is making himself known to us. Romans 1 and Psalm 19 indicate that one way in which God makes himself known to us is through his creation. This is generally what we call general revelation or natural revelation. In general revelation, God makes himself known for all people, to all people from all time. This kind of revelation is not specific, but it's limited to what we can see in nature or even in history. Without more specific revelation, a person cannot really enter into a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Unfortunately, many Christians dismiss the, the importance of natural revelation for Christian growth and witness, but this trend has been changing. On the other hand, sometimes we, we neglect the idea that we need to take that special revelation, the word of God, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ to others. The other kind of, of revelation that we speak about in theology is called special revelation or particular revelation. Special revelation is the process in which God makes himself known to specific people at definite times and places so that they can enter into a relationship with himself. The Bible is the primary means of special revelation today. So we see here from Genesis 1 a number of important teachings emerging uh, about creation itself and uh, about uh, our work uh, in this world. We learn a lot about revelation and how God is communicating with us. We'll move on to explore many of these other details in future uh, mini-lectures.